first two are about to come up. Um, the first is Joe Dunthorne, and he will be familiar to you. Both his collections of poetry um, that have appeared um, on Faber's list amongst many others, uh, and for his two novels, the first of which is Submarine, which was made into a film a couple of years ago, and the second novel, Wild Abandon, which was published earlier this year by Penguin. And he's going to read something new for us this evening, which is, um, I understand, a choose your own adventure story. So if you'd like to welcome Joe, please. Hi. Hi. Um, thanks for staying in the room when everyone else left. Kind of you. Um, so, I'm going to read a choose your own adventure story. Does anybody else remember choose your own adventure stories? Yes. Um, so that means that the few of you that are here are going to get picked on in some, in some way. Not picked on. You're just going to have to put your hand up. So it's a, an update of the normal Choose Your Own Adventure story, which is normally set, you know, Dungeons and Dragons and you fight fighting trolls and things. So this is a contemporary version of that, uh, set at a picnic. And I just thought, because there's a kind of background music, if you imagine the picnic scenario, at the far end of the park there is a festival and that's the music, so just so nothing feels uh, inconsistent. It's called You Are Happy. The sun is bright. Complicated silhouettes drift across the grass. You're sat next to your partner, Alex, who is lying out reading a book about bad practice in food manufacture called Not on the Label. You're sat cross-legged on a tartan blanket. There are olives, artisan bread, and red pepper hummus in a Waitrose bag. You went to Waitrose because it seemed like a place that understood happiness. You're in the shade. In the distance, a family are playing rounders. There is a tall lady walking a pointer. The sun is still on its way up, and you have noticed a patch of shadow around you shrinking, the distinct blades of grass. You burn easily. You fear cancer. Taking the lid off the olives, you wonder whether to have a black one or a green one. You watch the line of shade shift. What do you do? So um, the first decision, in case you haven't realised, is to choose a green or a black olive. I should say that the decisions get more challenging as the story progresses. So um, let's have a show of hands. Who would like a green olive? Uh, who would like a black olive? Okay, definitely green. The green olive is stuffed with a whole clove of garlic. The flesh is soft and tangy, the garlic crunchy but not overpowering. You have read a fact sheet that says garlic is particularly good at preventing stomach and prostate cancers. Recently, you have taken to roasting whole bulbs in the oven, then spreading the garlic paste on a slice of saurine malt loaf. The smell stays on your fingers for days. Alex sometimes calls you the vampire slayer. Alex's feet are halfway in direct sunlight, like they're slowly being repainted. The sun will reach you within 10 minutes. You remember that once in Spain, when you were young, you fell asleep on the beach. Your mother put a beach towel over you as protection, except the towel wasn't long enough. It couldn't cover both your feet and your head. When you awoke, an hour and a half later, you couldn't stand up. It was four days before you were able to put on socks. Your skin came away like flip-flops, kicked off around the apartment. You got piggybacks everywhere. As Alex is turning one page back and forth, rereading something, Alex makes a sound. He's thinking. And he's in! Okay. I'm going to give you two seconds to decide. Okay, now you have to sit down. <clears throat> As Alex is turning one page back and forth, rereading something, Alex makes a sound, a kind of clicking noise like a frustrated international ping pong player. You lean over and look at the chapter heading, Our Daily Bread. Do you, A, ask why Alex made that clicking sound, B, suggest they move further into the shade, C, rub Alex's back warmly, or D, put on sun cream. So uh, the four options, ask why Alex made a clicking sound, 
B, suggest you move into the shade. C, rub Alex's back warmly. Or D, put on sun cream. I think we'll just keep going with a show of hands because there's nothing you to get an accurate reading. Who wants to ask why Alex made a picking sign? 12, who wants to ask to move into the shade? Okay, none of you, but four of you. Who wants to rub Alex's back warmly? I'd say, uh, affectionate, but not, not gonna win. Who wants to put on sun cream? Nobody, okay. Ask why Alex made that clicking sound. What's that, you say? Hmm? What are you reading? The horrors of mass-produced bread, Alex says. But our bread came from Waitrose, you say. Big whoop, Alex says. Our bread has the name of the man who made it on the wrap. Tim Grange. Alex doesn't look convinced. The producers blast the bread with hot air and hydrogenated fat. This artificially inflates the bread. The fat helps, leak, helps the loaf keep its shape. Tim would never do that, you say. And they use triple the normal amount of yeast. They're going, it's fine, they had to think about it now. <laughs> And they use triple the normal amount of yeast to get the bread to rise quicker. You see that sunlight has reached the back of Alex's knees. It is inches from your feet. You try not to think about cancer. Alex says you always spoil nice summer days by talking about cells mutating. Ch, Alex says, turning a page, starting a chapter entitled, Eggs is Eggs. What do you do? A, ask to move further into the shade. B, consider cancer. C, ask about eggs. Or D, apply sun cream. We'll have a kind of yelling style round for this. So ask to move into the shade, consider cancer, ask about eggs, apply sun cream. Who wants to ask to move into the shade? Make a noise. Shade. Who wants to consider cancer? Maybe just say the word cancer. Who wants to ask about eggs? Say the word eggs. Eggs. Who wants to apply sun cream? Okay, it is definitely eggs. Yes. Anyway, what's so bad about eggs? I haven't read it yet. Eggs are great. I haven't read it yet, Alex says. Where would we be without eggs? You lie down on the blanket and kiss Alex's shoulder. Exactly, you say. Alex kisses you to keep you quiet. The book falls closed. Alex's eyes are closed. You see on the path a crocodile of school children paired off, holding hands, led by their teacher. You start to feel a little frisky. Alex's tongue on your teeth, the leaves rattling above you. You close your eyes, the sun on your eyelids, red blotches melt and shift. Your flat is across the road from the park and you would like to have sex. Do you A, suggest that you head back to the flat or B, continue making out for a bit. Um, again, a yelling, I think, for these two. Suggest to head back to the flat, continue making out for a bit. Who wants to head back to the flat and make any noise? Yeah. <laughs> Who wants to continue making out? Yes. Yeah. yes. I, like the way, I like the way you said it, but it was quiet, so you lose. Um, so you're going to go back to the flat. <clears throat> you walk through the park holding hands, trying to match your stride to Alex's, the smell of chlorine as you pass the Lido. Leaving the park, you see two men in the street, their cars at angles to the curb, exchanging insurance details and getting on famously. You cross the road and Alex already has the key out. The atmosphere is stuffy in the hallway, a pile of bike and mountaineering catalogues from the previous tenant, Bruno Lathe. You watch Alex's bum as you climb the stairs. You find Alex very attractive. Alex pulls you inside the flat and goes straight to the front room. This is serious. Before the sex act, please clarify yours and Alex's genders. So, in case you haven't worked it out, you get to choose. You can be a woman and Alex can be a woman. You can be a man and Alex can be a man. You can be a woman and Alex can be a man. Or you can be a man and Alex can be a woman. Uh, so we have a show of hands. I should just say it doesn't necessarily have to reflect your actual orientation. Feel free to swim out into the world of new experience. Um, so options, woman and woman, man and man, woman and man, man and woman. So who would like to be a woman and for Alex to be a woman? Put your hand up. One, two, three, four, five. Who would like to be a man and for Alex to be a man? 
One, two, three, four, five, six. Who would like to be a woman and for Alex to be a man? Five, six, seven. Who would like to be a man and for Alex to be a woman? One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, uh, so it was you are a woman and Alex is a man by one vote. So when you think about a small audience, it can feel very close. You unbutton Alex's shirt and kiss his chest. He has comically small nipples. You untie his shorts and pull them down. He kicks off his bim soles. He never wears underwear and it was too hot for socks. He's naked. You're still dressed and this makes Alex feel a little awkward. His right hand holds his left elbow. His cock bobs gently. You can smell him, but not in a bad way. He's standing in a patch of sun as if it were a spotlight. From the street, if the Barrow boys chanced to look up, they would see his cyclist's bum. You pull down the blinds and roll the spinny chair behind Alex. You push him down into the seat. You straddle him and snog for a while. He reaches under your skirt, pulls aside your knickers and starts to mess around. It's an awkward angle, so he's not completely successful. You stand up and take off your knickers, kicking them off across the room. Hiking up your skirt, you guide Alex inside. You feel his foreskin pull back. You think it will be funny, so you kick off the wall and the spinny chair rattles across the room. Both of you intertwine. Vibrations from the uneven floor. You spin in circles around the room. Alex controlling things with his feet. Dirty ballerinas, your legs out straight. I just say, um, that phrase, dirty ballerinas. Quite a few people come to my website by Googling that phrase. And they get redirected and they're disappointed when they get to find a, <laughs> find a choose your own adventure story. A tiny blown the ending, there's only one like that. Once this stops being funny, you return to straight out rutting, which is quick and loud and memorable, the end. Thank you very much, cheers. Next up we have Gwendolyn Riley, um, who's written three novels, um, and she's going to be reading from her fourth novel, which is called Opposed Positions. If you'd like to welcome Gwendolyn, please. Okay, I'm not reading from that, I've had a last minute change of heart. So I've been writing these monologues recently, and this is just one of them. Peace, I suppose. <clears throat> well, I have been, I am, confident, but that just went. My mates were coming around and I kept saying, next week, next week, next week. Couldn't leave the house, couldn't go out for a Mars bar, couldn't go out for my stickers. I just stayed in. I had fish in my bedroom. Oh, I had all sorts. Yes, I did have angel fish, but what that did to me, what did that to me was guilt, primarily. I had a guilty feeling. I was selling drugs, wasn't I? And I was thieving. Well, first thing was, I stole all these trees when I was 13. The uh, Forestry Commission had planted them by our estate, and I took them all and planted them by the canal. Well, that's where I wanted them to be, isn't it? They sent me to Winwick for that. Do you know Winwick? Oh, it's a magnificent old building, derelict now. They let everybody out. I had to go there three times a week. My therapist was called Morag. She used to say, oh, John, why do you keep thieving things? Why do you do it? And then I was selling drugs in Greece after that, and thieving. Uh, this woman off our estate took me, but then she went back. I was on my own on the deck of this ferry, ferry going from one island to another, and I was that frightened. And then as often happens, and as I'm sure you know, a person on their own will be taken advantage of, and falling in with the wrong people is quite easy, and that's what happened next. So first I was walking up and down in the evenings, handing out flyers to all the girls, and then next thing I was robbing, wasn't I? That was in Falaraki. I was just living in these digs with all the others until one day we were robbing this apartment and they only came back, this whole family. So we all jumped off the balcony, running away, only I broke my ankle, so they sent me home then. Well, not home, they sent me to Amsterdam. I only had shorts and a t-shirt on and I had no money. Oh, I can't remember how I got home right now. I was depressed, wasn't I? I didn't care what happened. 
Anyway, I was in Oldham after that. I had a tiny room there in a high old house. It had like graffiti in the room, no bed. I used to hyperventilate myself so I could pass out. Have you never done that? Oh, it's very effective. And then I was working in Butlins after that, in Bethelli on the fairgrounds. And then I was working in the back of a chip shop. I had a flat there, but there was nothing in it. I had some wood I got off the beach. It wasn't furniture. I don't know what you'd call it. I had. I've got some real treasures off that beach though, some real treasures, only I lost them all. Then I went to Hong Kong with the fairground, then Dubai with the fairground. I used to have to weigh, to weigh the cans there because they're very good throwers, the Arabs, as you know, real good throwers. I used to eat the breakfast with the Arabs though. They have their tea in a glass, no milk, but carnation milk they have, and they have chickpea curry for breakfast, and chapatis with sugar on them for breakfast. I was in my rel religious phase then, so I'd have to preach in the mornings too. Well, I'd gather people about, wouldn't I? I used to say, now you know how many seeds in an apple, but how many apples in a seed? Earl's Town Market happened on Saturdays, and the car park by Quicksave, men old, the older men stood by their tables of gas masks, old ice fire books, rusty fishing kit. It was filthy weather when we went down, but the merchandise had been set up regardless. So there was a sudden settee for sale and dripping wet computer monitors. Bales of clothing came thudding down from one lorry, rolling like heavy dice into the brake light coloured puddles. Treasure, John said, bending over and rifling through a line of cardboard boxes. Treasure, 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 treasure. He'd let his dog off the leash too, and the white and brindle whip it was skidding about, putting its nose in where he could. Milo, John said, just wait by your master now. Okay, come on, my little gypsy. Oh yes you are, if you come out here with me, you're my little gypsy. You'll have mud on your shoes soon enough, that's how you tell a gypsy. Oh my god, look at your shoes, where are your shoes? Well come on, we're going to meet my chickens now. Stop whinging, this isn't cold. It's going to get a lot colder than this. I was only telling Ryan in work, this weather hasn't snapped yet. I said when winter comes, it will come on the wings of a white owl. I saw it come on last year, swooping under the passing place. I saw its shadow all, all along the boat. Ryan said, oh, John, why do you have to talk in such an old tongue? Now, feeding this horse is optional. Come on, you might see some deer here, too, if you're lucky and you're quiet. You're like a deer, aren't you? Uh, don't know, dangly and a uh, fair? Here we go. They're off their lay right now because of the cold, but also because of these devil hens someone's put in. Wait till you see them, they've got red eyes. They've been bullying my nice Kellogg's cornflakes, cornflakes hens. Okay, now, this one's my favourite. Do you want to hold? One night, me and Wonky Donkey were out, and I said I wanted to come back here and kill this one. And I had one pint, and I had two pints trying to get my courage up, but I couldn't do it. I couldn't even catch her. And I said, oh, no, I can't. Then he said, then he, said he would, and he was climbing over, and I said, oh, no, you don't, because you can't have another man kill your chickens, can you? I'll have to do it one of these days, though. Oh, yes, I will. That's what they're for. I want to kill a rabbit too, only Milo can't catch them. I'll have to buy one. Oh yes, I will. And then I'll kill it, skin it, cook it, eat it, enjoy it, and then I'll make its fur into a shoe, and then I'll play a tune with its bones. Now come on, hold on to me. Don't want any slippings over tonight. With a fistful of jumper, I followed him down a steep slope rigged with slithering roots, and then another muddy field. He said he's lost his keys, and so instead the heavy gate we'd reached rattled as the chain cradled his foot, and then with a heave and a scramble he was crouching up there between dagger spikes, and then he dropped and was hanging there behind the bars before he dropped again with a thud. Now just wait there, he said, and watch that dog. There were dark boats everywhere, pinned under tarpaulin, crumpled like wax paper, or tipped over and half stripped. All my boats I've bought with a gentleman's agreement. I say I'm an honest lad and I'm in full-time employment, which I can provide proof of, and I'd like to purchase this boat in instalments, please. I've got three now. Splendid, alchemy, and lady. Only ladies in the water right now. We'll get an alchemy. She's going to be cold until I get that fire going, but don't you worry, because then she'll get real warm. Now, I've got some lettuce and some tomatoes in the bag for, that vegetari for the vegetarian, uh, you. And I got some rice from the Indian place. I stole two glasses from work too, so we can drink our tea like the Arabs do. Up a ladder and then down through a hatch. It was pitch dark until he lit the lamp. And then I was looking at a room that was much like a shed, bare, dirty wood walls and floor. On the floor was a kettle, a radio, a broom, his tomahawk axe, and then one tin mug, one plate, and lined up behind them 
and open jars of parsley, sage, rosemary, thyme. Now sit down, John said. The mattress was thin and pilled, the duvet heavy and greasy. So I've not made any money today, he said, on his haunches now, starting the fire, but I got three bicycles yesterday from the scrapyard and I sold two in work. Last one I'm gonna do up and then I can sell her for 50 pounds. Uh, yeah, of course I do. Well, nice things are always she, aren't they? Boat, she, bike, she. Anyway, where was I up to then? Oh yeah, and then uh, there's a game fair in Clitheroe next weekend, so I'm thinking I might go and buy two peacocks there to go with my chickens. You'd like to see that, wouldn't you? Two peacocks in wooden cages, and I'm walking through town with them over my shoulders. Of course you would. Oh, and girl, she. After we'd eaten, he took his mug into the corner, tilted his head, he slid the window open to slop out, and then held the mug out for me. In the morning, he turned on the radio just as the pips were sounding before today, and then again, he was feeding the fire, then sweeping the length of the boat quickly, with his head down, nudging forward like a bower bird. He was only wearing his jumper, then he did some press-ups, then he sat on the floor and pulled his wellingtons on. Milo! Oh, there's no one around. We only went up the towpath, showing our colours, weren't we, Milo? And then he went for a wee, and then I went for a wee on his wee. What? Where? Oh, there's sweat glands. Those white spots, they're sweat glands. I've had them looked at before. Oh, you were worried, weren't you? Now listen, baby. Just don't look at my balls and don't look at my feet, neither, actually. If you get worried, right, just look at my face and my muscles. Oh, it's you, is it? Okay, now listen, if you don't stop ringing me because I'm getting fed up now, I'm gonna batter you, I'm gonna smash your face in. Now, I can't smell any Gwendolyn's on this fist yet, but it's still early, so. Did I? Okay, I uh, can't remember now. Oh, no, that's it. I was going to say I'd enjoy a couple of hours of your company tonight. Well, what about tomorrow night? Oh, go on. Okay, well, I'll just have to go to the wash house after work and then go to Debenhams and put some aftershave on. And then I can come round yours about seven. Okay, good. Well, can't think of anything else to say right now. Goodbye. Stop ringing me. <laughs> You've landed on your feet here, haven't you? Where's your flatmate? Is she? <coughs> Shut up. It's nice. But you've got your privacy, haven't you? Have you ever lived in a bed sitter? At least you're not there, people banging on your door all night, goading you because you're quiet. Yes, we could watch a film, or we could snug each other's faces off. Come on, give me a squeeze. Oh, that's not a squeeze. Come on, love your man. Oh, can't we stay in? I'm banned from half the places around here. Can I make a cup of tea? Okay, you sit down then. I think you could do with a cup of tea as well, couldn't you? Don't know, uh, all different reasons. Well, I just get overexcited, don't I? Like if a song comes on that I like, I have to like kick things. Or if there's like a light swing, I can't leave that alone, can I? So then inevitably the bouncer will come and pay me a visit. If you back that one more time, okay, sir. So then what do you think I do the moment his back is turned? That's right. I threw all these coins in a bouncer's face last week. Oh, can't we stay in? I'll watch any film, I don't care. Now here's your tea, so pipe down about going out now, please. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed that. He had some good clothes, didn't he? What's his name? John Cassa. Okay, now let's us do some pagan rituals. Come on, let's us play witches. Now, witches don't take their own clothes off, do they? They take off each other's clothes. Stripping. You strip me? Oh, then you must not want me enough. Go on, I'm your slave, baby. Dirty witch. Get your big, fat, um, womanly body. Well, you have. Listen, do you want to have this conversation on your own whilst I go outside and have a cigarette? What's it like kissing a beard, is it? Mind you, I suppose it's just like kissing a pussy hole, isn't it? I was ever saying to Ryan, who'd want to kiss a beard? And he said, you like kissing hairy pussies, don't you? And I, yeah, I do, come on, more love. More kisses, baby, mas amore. Give me a love bite, go on, harder. I want to be a slag. Now in the morning, there will be a selection of pastries, coffee, cereals, and orange juice. I don't care if you want them, well, I'll eat them. Oh, let me, let me play house. Let me go up into gathering, I don't get a chance. Okay, okay, flame in hell, quiet down. Quiet down, now listen, I've got a story for you that I think you'll appreciate, okay. Can you be quiet for two minutes, please? Thank you. So last Christmas, I went drinking around here, and I was in here, and then I went to Britannia, and then I went to the Twisted Wheel, and I drank and I drank, and I missed my last tram. I had no money, so I was trying to get to sleep in this entry by the casino. It was that cold, I just filled up. And then all these lads came, and they started mocking me. They were all drunk and goading me, laughing at me, laughing at my boots. And then he started spitting on me. I said, let a man sleep. And you won't guess what they did then. They took one of my boots. 
They took my Wellington boot and ran off with it. And I went after them, but they were throwing it between them and laughing. I was swinging at them, shouting, oh, will you not let me be? Will you not let a man be? But that's not the end of the story. Oh, no. So I was walking down Whitwell Street, right, under the arches in one boot, and the wind was blowing, and it was that cold that I found this bin, and I got in it. Oh, and I was so happy when I shut that bin lid. No more aggression. No more goading. Oh, but I'll never forget that smell. Then in the morning, I had to go and get help. I had to walk through town with one boot, just pretending, trying to be normal, pretending I had two boots. I told my mum and she said, oh, John, has that cheered you up, has it? Oh, how did I know? How did I know you'd like that story? Okay, well, when we get in later, I've been thinking we could try this. I'll be a eunuch and you be a sultana. I'm your eunuch, baby. You just call me when you want to get me out of my box. I don't have been, my box. I just stay in my box when I'm not servicing my sultana. Or how about, I'll be the Spartans and you be Kira Knightley. Oh, come on, this depression has gone on long enough. Dry those tears, baby. Do you want more drinks? We're all depressed, aren't we? I'm not bored and lonely every day. I finished with him after six weeks. I made that decision one morning and then just lay waiting for him to go, watching peacefully as he slid the change off my desk, found his matchboxes on the floor. I could tell him later, over the phone, or maybe, more likely, I could just stop answering the phone. You can read on Lady, though, can't you? He was saying. I can pull her along, and you can stay inside reading, or preparing, preparing our tea, like peeling potatoes, or reading. I don't want to come on the boat, I said. Hey, Milo, he said, out in the hallway now. He stopped in my doorway before he left, though, to peer down at me again, arms folded, with a small screw's head notch between his eyebrows. Are you sure your last name's Riley? He said, no, I said. Are you sure your last name's not uh, Poulier? He said, are you sure your mother didn't have it away with a Spanish milkman? Because you are like a bloody Spaniard, you are. The amount of time you spend lying in that bed, I don't know. Milo, come on.
Paul Silver on the keyboards, and Jimmy Northern on the drums.
say that you were born and angels got together and decided to create a dream come true. So they sprinkle more dust in your hair, pull this planet in your eyes of blue. That is why all the girls in town follow you. Oh, 
Oh, mm-hmm.